those videos where I'm going to try convincing people to get into a thing I'm into, which I suck at doing. So if you haven't already watched this show, just humor me for the next few minutes. And before people get on my case, this show's target audience age range is 26 years old. This is totally guilt free. I normally watch more series than I do movies. And the thing with me is that I like to diversify what I watch, so it takes me a while to consider what I want to spend my time on. Does the narrative treat its queer characters and characters of color correctly? Does it end in a satisfying way? Is the premise trying to do something new with the genre it's set up? Did they treat the crew right in the making of the show? Is it made by decent people? That's generally my standard for consuming media in general. Books, shows, movies, etc. I know it sounds tedious, overly ethical, and probably would take too much time, but you'd be surprised how many good things out there are made by perfectly decent people, if you know where to look. Yes, I am absolutely throwing shade at Disney and Harry Potter fans. Die mad about it. <laughs> and okay, Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts definitely wasn't one of those things that I looked into too extensively before I started watching. I found it when it finished releasing its first season around the time I finished re-watching all four seasons of Shira that was out around the time. <laughs> I made sure to watch a few reviews of it and there were a lot of favorable things to be said about the music in it that I was intrigued enough to check it out and I watched at least two episodes every night and to this day I believe that was the best decision I've ever made. <laughs> I got me and my sister hooked. So, for full context, Keep on the Age of Wonder Beasts is an animated young adult series about life after the apocalypse. Animals have mutated into walking, talking, society-forming sentience, and humans have decided to burrow and live underground instead of cohabitating with them. The show starts when our main character, 13-year-old Kipo Oak, mysteriously pink, is pulled away from her burrow and meets Wolf another human, 10 years old, who has lived in the surface for most of her life, and she decides to help Kipo get back to her burrow safely. Well, tries to, at least. It's an enduring commentary on growth, community, small group dynamics, diversity, friendship, and love. The animation is phenomenal, the soundtrack is exquisite, the story is amazing, and the humor is spot on. What more do you want me to say? This show is literally one of the best three season run shows with an original concept since Avatar The Last Airbender ended in 2008. And you can see everything on the screen at all times. Oh my god, you literally know what's happening 100% of the time. Isn't that great? <clears throat> I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me. Anyhow, this video is not spoiler free because I have never been good at recommending things to people without getting specific. So if you want to go in blind, you're going to have to look elsewhere or just Trust me and start the show yourself. I am giving patrons and Kofi supporters a drive link to the entire series if you don't want to watch it on Netflix, so maybe consider that. Long time subscriber or not, forget everything you've seen about reviews and video essays. I'm throwing all of that to the wind because I am literally a writer first, a fan second. So what I'm going to be doing is talking about just the writing. Yeah, you heard that right. It's just, it's gonna take more than one part if I had to talk about everything, alright? Live with it. You know, sometimes I'll just stop and think that I'm getting paid to do this, and like, I get to be so self-indulgent about it. It's barely $20 per video, but... This definitely will be coming with comparisons to these following media, with appropriate spoiler warnings for those, and this list will be coming with its own criticism section, because besties and babes, we have to learn how to rightfully criticize the things we love in order to learn and grow. Alright? Alright. Kipo has a lot of solar characters, and that says a lot for an ensemble cast. Behind the succinctness to the writing of each character is actually a really nice set of rules. It goes from factions to individuals. Best of all, it's all in the music. Writing for the factions involves using the Planet of Hats trope and attaching a musical motif to each group. A light motif too, they recur often enough. That generally means each group has their own visual gimmick and associated musical genre, instrument, or song if their leader gets one. The timber cats are lumberjacks and are usually accompanied by banjo music. The umlaut stakes have heavy metal and a whole lot of leather and spikes. Scarlamine and his lackeys are associated with classical music and... uh... The French? Used to be they were emo. The mod frogs with their suits and ties, the dubstep bees, the theaters, you get the gist. 
This way they seem like legitimate groups that you can visually and orally identify and distinguish from one another. They also come with their own set of mannerisms and cultures. Then you get to the individual characters per group. And the trick they do with that is only having to flesh out leaders of the group. Because it's very easy to write a community reacting to what their leader does and having them follow what the leader wants them to do. So there's Scarlamane, Yum Yum, Molly, Cotton, etc. And all these characters consolidate what their groups represent. And the brilliant thing about these characters is that they're introduced at the cusp of needing to change. Because really that's what the whole show is about. Kipo, who herself has to change to grow, changes the people around her. And it all has to do with the music. The one odd thing I noticed was that this Planet of Hats thing doesn't really reflect on humans. With the sole exception of mentioned group leader mute characters, short for mutant, in case you don't know, the humans adapt a lot more easily to change than the mutes do. Hell, humans don't even have a distinct culture, just that they're largely underground and wear jumpsuits. This is made even more apparent by the way Kipo likes to make up songs as she goes. There isn't a human's leitmotif or signature in this. There is only Kipo's endearingly clumsy lyrics that she makes up as she goes, and the heavy dragon snap beats of the trying to survive the surface with wolf, Benson, and Dave. Humans don't have music. They just live with it, borrow from a time where there was human music, or just live with that. Which is incredibly Kipo having music in her, having it be a part of her character, well, it's not incidental. Even if Leo was the one who taught her music, there's still that through line of Song, her mother. Leo and Song were outliers in their last burrow because they didn't want to regress mutes. They wanted to coexist with them. Kipo is a product of that desire. She's part mute. Mega mute, to be exact. So. Really, it makes sense that she's bridging these gaps between mute factions and mutes and humans. Benson, Dave, and Wolf are also actually great examples of this. Benson was raised partly in a human cult, but largely by Dave, an immortal mute he befriended after they settled their differences and saved each other's lives. Benson has a neat relationship with music in that he uses what he finds, usually old cassette tapes and CDs, and most of them being old school hip hop, which is pretty cute. And he shares every bit of that music with Dave, and eventually, Troy. Wolf was raised by... well wolves and she's actually one of the biggest opposers to this whole hamufa thing uh what's a hamufa remember the human mute ultimate friendship alliance oh right i thought we all agreed that idea was crazy no you said this is crazy we all agree then you walked out because even when she trained and tried hard to be a part of her pack she was reminded of her humanity and that she was just a girl in wolf's clothing. She starts out very no-nonsense and only tolerates music once her bond with Kipo grew secure. But, in people who watch the show, you'll have noticed this before the whole Heroes on Fire episode. Since she was raised by wolves, that would raise a little association with music through the Newton wolves. And you're right, the Newton wolves are really big on science and bow science, and they have this whole heavy beat rap theme going on with them. Wolf, in a sense, has a lot of rap and heavy beats in her soundtracks. This includes all the fight and chase scenes she's in, and that changes when they encounter the mega dogs near the entrance to the Cloverboro, where it turns into more of an up pop, no doubt, Kipo with Benson's influence. And it changes progressively throughout the seasons. And before you go on and say I'm being a little tinfoil hatty over here, they did prove it in season 3 with Promises, one of the only musical episodes where the humans got to sing as a whole not just when they needed to bring people back from the brink, like in the seasons and two finale, I think. The other strength they have in this show is the heart. Allegedly. I've seen critics compare this to both Atla in terms of world building and Steven Universe in terms of heart, and I can't say I don't see why, but I think that's underselling it a bit. Like, no offense to Steven Universe, but the vibes, they're just different. I've watched both shows. <laughs> they are Kipo the show being adapted from a webcomic has the strength of authenticity. It's one of those narratives where kindness, compassion, and idealism isn't seen as a weakness to grow out of, and it doesn't feel cliche. Kipo's main strength as a character and a unifier is the fact that she is aggressively kind. Like, she held this guy captive for weeks just to force him to learn to apologize and mean it. People hate characters who don't have any believable flaws, and honestly, I think that's just because your disbelief wasn't suspended high enough. Because that isn't 
a flaw on the character but on the author. If you don't think a character is ever going to behave like that or don't see a character as a person, that means the character writing is weak. Kipo, on the other hand, Kipo's main flaw is that she takes on too much in hopes of wanting a better future. And she trusts that the world around her will be just as kind. Expect it even. She's 13 for Christ's sake. Are you really going to be mad at her for that? And the funny thing is when people let her down, she doesn't see it as a problem in their character. She sees it as them having a problem. Learning is usually like that. Nothing should be disabling you from learning. If there is, we need to get rid of it before it sticks. Wolf's main flaw is that her desire can take a turn to the extreme. In one of the best character arcs of the first season, Wolf hides a clue from Kipo about where they can find the backup burrow because she didn't want Kipo to leave her. And it ends in tears when the guilt of it, like everything else that Kipo does, ends up saving her. She's 10 and she was alone before this. Of course she'll behave like that. Kind of a bars on the floor situation here, but um, it's just really refreshing to see well-written young girls be allowed to have these traits and still be considered good and deserving of the love they want. And it works to improve the progression of the story instead of damaging it. Like, wow, maybe men can write girl. <laughs> and being a young adult series, I can't understand why the through line of the show is that there are no villains, only people. There's an underlying assumption in most fiction that emotional and moral binaries are a little childish. And yeah, they kind of are in any narrative you like. You can talk all you want about how you want evil villain for the sake of a character is back in Disney, but that's wanting the narrative to tell you who to root for. Which is all fine and dandy in some fiction. Not all. Particularly in um, children's fiction. You can have furling mustache evil guy in there, but not in anything else. <laughs> like, I'm serious. It's, it's cheap and it's really bad. And it's like taking out your audience. In all three seasons, there are no enemies, just people with opposing views, having misunderstandings, and maintaining them. From the Timbercats and Umlaut Snakes, to Scarlamine and Leo, to Dr. Amelia and the entire Oak family, Wolf and Scarlamine included. And really, the takeaway with how impressive that all is, is that since they were heavily serialized in their three season run, they were forced to form all these associations and effectively use them as a huge part of the story itself within a limited time frame. Something I don't think most shows do effectively often these days. I brought up Atla earlier and it's not a complete stretch comparing them because Atla did kind of the same thing too but the difference is that Atla was given a lot of slack in comparison. Okay let me explain. Serials on TV usually have an overarching plot over the span of seasons that's connected through mini arcs per one to three episodes. Episodic shows are allowed to be more loose and anthological. Anime have the similar predicament of being in the middle of those two types. That's why a lot of anime have filler arcs and bonus themed episodes. They're usually given the runtime they need to tell or finish the story, on top of extra runtime that they can use to either let the characters just breathe or for fan service. Anime like this have episodes about holidays, summer breaks, mountain retreats, and festivals like Tanabata or cherry blossom viewings. The possibilities are endless, really. Though I do think there's been a sudden downtick to those, unless it's like one of the big shonen ones. Then again, I haven't watched any anime, so... <laughs> Like, I haven't watched a lot recently, so don't take my word for it. Adla had a lot of these. No fan service, thank god, but they had the time to make those little three-in-one anthology episodes that let them develop a lot of their overall lore and a lot of their ensemble characters on top of little fun segments like the Fire Squad Beach episode of Everyone's Bisexual Awakenings and that one episode where the gang got to witness a play about themselves, which really enhanced the experience of the entire narrative and worked to their favor because one of the many things as fans remember about Atla is their expansive world building and strong ensemble character writing. What's the difference between that and Kipo's three season run? Well, time. Netflix's system of giving creators a set number of hours for their shows meant that the Kipo crew only had about 10 hours of content they could create on the get-go, and they could only work on so much story within those time restraints within a few years. Atla had about 24 hours of content within the span of 5 years, and they were only given permission to make more every time they got renewed for a new season. That's why it's important for showrunners to end not just seasons, but episodes on cliffhangers and why The Legend of Korra got the shit end of the stick. So, 
A lot of people the show had to be setting up and paying out the serialized story they wanted to tell in as short a time as possible while giving the characters some time to breathe between the big events. The upside to that is that they weren't on the brink of being cancelled at the end of every season because they were already done producing the other seasons around the time the first one was released. Remember, all three seasons were released in the same year. And they did that incredibly well. The efficiency of it seems simple enough, but it takes a lot of effort, say five writers amount, to effectively nail the effortlessness down. And that's on top of the crew being underpaid by Netflix's relentless hour assigning system. What are you saying? Is the less runtime the better? Well, definitely not. If you saw my video about Tresa, you know why. If you haven't, well, having a team of writers around two years of production time and a Korean animation studio does not a good animated series make. Hell, you don't even have to watch my Tresa video to know that. Just look at whatever the hell happened to Voltron. That show was given 8 seasons and they boshed it. It's a mech show, how could you possibly fuck that up? Anyway, I think that about wraps up all the things I wanted to highlight about the show. Kipo has a lot of great moments and incredible scenes that make me cry every time I watch it. And that's a big achievement because I'm not really much of a crier. It's really one of those shows that I can't not watch when it's on, you know? And I feel like it's taken its place up there with Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood and Avatar The Last Airbender in the list of animated shows I like to rewatch and it never gets old. It's really very timeless. So I hope what I said is a good way to convince you to watch it or rewatch it, I don't know. I know one of my patrons really wanted me to do this because we both really love the show and don't think it gets enough attention. Likes and comments are appreciated. Subscribing is optional. Tell me who your favorite Kipo character is or what scene makes you cry all the time. Mine is Wolf and the entirety of Song Remix makes me want to punch something. Shout out to Jeanette and Evie. Thanks to them and the rest of my patrons, you got to watch this video. If you want to join them in helping me keep this up, support me on Patreon or Kofi. You'll be getting early access to videos, updates on the production process, and bloopers. So many bloopers. <laughs> Stay safe. Ingat tayong lahat. Bye!